everybody. Everybody, listen. You're all here because we all love science fiction, and I assume some of you read a book called World War Z. Uh, the reason we're here, the reason I'm here with these grown-ups, is <laughs> we're going to talk about the real World War Z. We're going to talk about real plagues and real bioterror, and also how easily it is to stop, even easier than zombies. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Asha George, who former Army intel officer and knows a thing or two about bioterror. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Max. Um, uh, hi, I am Asha George. I am a former intel officer in the Army. Uh, I also happen to have a couple of degrees in public health and uh, have been looking at biodefense for quite some time, for, for many decades now. Um, I'm the executive director for the Blue Ribbon Study Panel on Biodefense. And uh, aside from that, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Ken Weinstein to uh, Max's right. Uh, Ken Weinstein uh, has been involved in public service for quite some time. Uh, you can check out his bio online, but I think uh, there are a couple of interesting things uh, that, that you might want to know about him. One is that uh, he was the chief of staff for then FBI director Robert Mueller, who put out a little report himself a little while ago. Um, and also, he's the former Homeland Security Advisor uh, under uh, the second George Bush. Uh, then, of course, you know Max. I feel a little silly introducing Max. Uh, for those of you who don't know, he wrote a little missive uh, called World War Z. Uh, and I'll just take one second to talk about that. From our perspective, that is an outstanding book. And it's not just because it's interesting, and it's not just because of the zombies. It is one of the best books on public health investigations, uh, how you would do it, what you'd need to think about, how you need to think outside the box, and how, how uh, crazy and painful and urgent uh, something like that can be. Um, we very much appreciate that. Uh, in addition, Max has been responsible for some uh, graphic novels, as you know, and today we're going to be talking about the one he's uh, agreed to do for us. Um, so... Let me turn it over to you, Max. Okay. So you guys, obviously, you know World War Z. And what you might not know is the novel World War Z was on the reading list for the U.S. Naval War College. And the president of Naval War College, Admiral Weisskopf, called me about 10 years ago and said, we'd like you to come speak. And so I said, are you sure you have the right guy? And you can see it on YouTube when I'm speaking, and I'm sort of flop sweating, and I'm nervous, and I keep thinking, like, isn't there a... Mike, isn't there, like, a lieutenant... <laughs> can you all hear me now? Yeah. All right, let's recap. World War Z, Naval War College, oh my God, are you sure you have the right guy? <laughs> but I must have said something, because then I started getting invited to speak at panels, uh, and not here. Uh, at strategic studies groups. I started running in military circles. Then I was invited to join a military think tank called the Modern War Institute at West Point. And it's an impressive stand-up of people. It's active duty army officers, intel analysts, prestigious academics, and me. <laughs> what we do is we study conflict, all of its perspectives, because conflict doesn't just mean people shooting each other. As we all know now, we are in an age of what they call the gray zone, which we all know cyber war, intel, information warfare, economic warfare, and germ warfare. There's many ways that people can hurt other people. And as part of my job for the Modern War Institute, I wrote an article about Zika. Remember when Congress was dithering about Zika and they were like, oh, well, maybe we should give money to fight it or maybe not. And I'm like, are you crazy? What if Zika had been cooked up in a lab? You guys are giving trillions of dollars to the military to blow stuff up and you won't spend a penny to stop a germ coming in that's actually hurting us? And I thought nobody listened. And then I was tapped by this blue ribbon biodefense panel. And these are people who are already working on keeping us safe. And they asked me to come to one of their hearings right down the street. And it was an emotional roller coaster. It was up, it was down. The, here's the bad news. Here's what I learned. 
the bad news is we are in a new age where it's very easy to get your hands on a germ. I don't know if you guys read the news lately about this homegrown terrorist, the ex-Coast Guard guy, or I think he might have been active. He was arrested right around here with a bunch of guns and a bunch of bombs, and he was ready to kill people, and he had a hit list. But what he also had was an internet search on the dark web where he had asked, how do I get my hands on a germ? Because I want to kill the most amount of people I can. Now, 20 years ago, you would have to smuggle things like anthrax out of a lab and then mail it around the country. I have a little bit of experience about this. Because when I wrote for Saturday Night Live, our workplace was hit with an anthrax attack. And I came into work and the whole place was shut down because there was anthrax. But that was 20 years ago. Now, anybody in a few years will be able to download the information for genetic manipulation and the kind of equipment that would have cost millions of dollars and you'd have to steal from a Soviet lab, you can get off the internet. You can get off eBay. So we're, we're approaching the age of the homegrown bioterrorist. That's the bad news. The good news is we just got to keep doing what we're doing to stay safe. Because germ warfare is the one place where you don't have to decide between peace and war. It's just public health. It's just investing money in our doctors. It's believing in science. It is vaccinating your children. It is doing all the things we used to do to keep natural viruses at bay. The problem is we've done such a good job of it, we're three generations away from those horrible days, so people are starting to question, and we're starting to backslide into ignorance. In order to get here, I had to walk through LAX, which was quarantined for measles, which supposedly had been wiped out. So we can do this, and that's what I learned at this hearing between these people. Oh wow, we can do this. But the one piece of the puzzle they were missing, because they had a ton of experts, doctors, intel experts, logisticians, what they didn't have was public outreach. Because they might be the experts, but we're the boss. Because we're the voters, and we're the taxpayers. We make the decisions. And so if we don't educate ourselves, we're not gonna vote for the right people who have the right programs who keep us safe. But how do we do that? because you guys shouldn't listen to this part. The problem with expertise sometimes are experts, <laughs> right? And sometimes they, and we go, <laughs> or sometimes they go too deep and we go, oh God, and we get scared and we go away. So how do we educate ourselves? What's a great tool for educating people like us? This. Comic books are not just entertainment. They're one of the greatest teaching tools ever. The US Army used to do it to train troops. The UN does it for public health. Recently, in an African country, they just put out a whole graphic novel on how to tell science apart from folklore. And by the way, the alt-right is using it to try to train people up. There's a lot of alt-right comics happening right now. So the bad guys get it, and we need to get it too. And so we've all gotten together and we put together germ warfare. And it's totally free. And you can get it at the doors when you leave. And it's just a history of how people have used germs through history to kill each other. Going way back to the ancient Greeks, when people put arrows in dung and blood and tried to, every arrow got an infection, to when they used to catapult dead plague bodies over city walls to the Japanese experiments in World War II, which they dropped flea bombs on China, to the Cold War, where we used to have massive stockpiles. You know, in the Cold War, we always talked about nuclear stockpiles. We used to have germs, too. And we might have gotten rid of our stockpiles, but other people haven't. So it's a reminder of where we've come from. So when you guys are watching TV and you see someone on CNN saying, we need we need to invest in good public health, you go, oh yeah, because what keeps us healthy also keeps us safe. And that's why we're doing this project. And so I'm gonna turn, what we're gonna do now is, is Mr. Weinstein is gonna talk to you for a little bit about what it means to keep us safe. 
And then I think the best thing to do is open the floor up to your questions. And we will try to answer them the best way we can and not put you to sleep and not freak you out. Go for it, Ken. Okay, good to see everybody. Um, as Max said, there are these experts out there who put you to sleep. Warning, that's me. <laughs> just, just everybody be duly warned. Sorry, I'm actually not that much of an expert. You got the real expert here you're gonna hear from, but um, I guess I know a little bit about how this, this city works, and that's why I'm here. But you might ask, why is sort of a, you know, middle-aged, and middle-aged charitably, but middle-aged uh, Homeland Security lawyer speaking at Awesome Com, and that would be a darn good question. And then the next question might be, why is a boring Homeland Security lawyer joined at the hip with a guy who's an expert on zombies and graphic novels? And that'd be an even better question. Um, but the reason is because we both share the same concern. And you heard it uh, from Max just now, and that is the concern uh, with the threat that this country's facing. And that we faced for years, but now I think we're at a sort of a critical point and it's something that we really need to get the message out about. And I'm thrilled that he's here. He's been a great partner. Um, and he's been a great partner to, to us, but also to this whole panel. And Asha told you about this. Very DC thing, right? If there's a problem, what do you do? You set up a committee, set up a panel, and then talk the issue to death. Well, we've done a little bit of that. But we've also you know, made some results. Um, this thing got stood up in 2014, I believe. And we got some people who are really impressive. We have um, Joe Lieberman. Tom Ridge, uh, Donna Shalala was on the, the committee until she became a congresswoman just the other day. Um, and uh, Jim Greenwood, uh, Lisa Monaco, former National Homeland Security Advisor, former Homeland Security Advisor, and then uh, also Tom Daschle. I saved Tom till the end because, as you know, he was U.S. Senator, Majority Leader, but I think most importantly for here, he was the victim of the anthrax attacks. He was actually got a letter sent directly to him, so like Max, he was directly affected by one of the main bioterrorism attacks that this country has had. And so he brings a really important perspective, a very personal perspective to our work, and I find it very valuable. Anyway, we've been working now for about five years, and um, you know, we've done all the DC things, right? The, the sort of the methods we've used, we've had congressional testimony, we've had meetings with Congress people trying to push them to, to legislate uh, to enhance our biodefense, to appropriate for biodefense measures, this kind of thing. We met with the White House, uh, pushed hard with the White House, both the Obama administration and the Trump administration. We've held just general public hearings. That's how we got to know Max, because he came and gave a riveting statement to us about uh, the problem and how he saw it from his in-depth research um, for his book. Anyway, that, those are the things that we've done. But still, there's, and we made some progress. I mean, we've got, uh, the, there's a national strategy that, that's now been put out. Once again, that sounds very wonky inside the beltway, but it's important. It shows that the executive branch, the, the administration has said, this is important, we need a national strategy, we've got to get all the authorities to coalesce, you know, all the different agencies and departments to coalesce around this objective and push forward. So we got that, that was one of our recommendations. We've gotten legislation from the Hill about the national strategy and about the budget. So. We're making progress, but where we really need help is getting the message out more generally because, as Max said, it's when the people, those of you who are at risk, those of us who are at risk, are actually making the point to their legislators in the press, generally, at cocktail parties, whatever, that, hey, this is important. And the problem, uh, and that's where this comes in, and that's where Max comes in, and just wait till you see this book. It's fabulous. I, um, I read through it again for the second time this morning, and you know, besides some eye-opening pictures of chopped off limbs and this kind of stuff, which is, you know, a little tough when you're eating your Wheaties in the morning, but really it's, it's, it makes the point. It really drives home how this has been a constant issue throughout history, all the way, as he said, to the classical era, and how it's now it's, it continues to be an issue, it being the threat of bioterrorism, the threat of pandemics, the whole nine yards. And so the point here is let's get this message out uh, and get it out loud and clear. Hence, uh, we've got today. So what I'd like to do is just, you know, ask you all to listen carefully. Think about what Max has said. Take a look at his book. I think it'll make you realize how, um, how serious it is. And if there's one thing that you get out of this book, it's, it's the following. And this is what I actually has motivated me since when Asha and a couple of her friends first approached me about doing this 
is that, you know, we, when we think about the threats that we're facing, we all think about the nuclear threat, big threat, big problem. As Max points out in his book, hard to actually build a nuclear bomb, hard for a terrorist to get the uranium, get the know-how to make a nuclear bomb. Um, we worry a lot about, you know, the just conventional weapons, you know, the terrorists will get. Yes, that's a danger, but they might kill a certain number of people, but there's sort of a maximum number of people an individual with a uh, typical conventional weapon can kill. But, you know, bio, the bio weapons are available anywhere. People can work them up in their basement, and they can kill people by the tens of thousands, if not more. And that's why I, th I think this is a threat that really needs everybody's attention. It doesn't get enough attention because, you know, when you don't, you're not hit with something, politics moves on and looks at the other things that are more, you know, more recent threats. It's only when, when the people step forward and say, government, we need you to do something about this. That's when we get action. That's when we get defenses up and that's when we feel safe. So this is an important part of that process. Really appreciate you being here, listening to us, and look forward to your questions. Yeah, what do you guys want to know? Yes. Uh, Mike? <laughs> uh, Germ Warfare, a graphic history, just went live today. It is free. It is downloadable. You go to germwarfare.org, and you can download a copy for free. Yes, miss. Good morning. It seems to me that this issue interlocks with the broader big picture issue of what keeps an animal healthy and happy. The social, getting enough sleep, getting proper nutrition, proper health care. I used to be a zoo docent. I saw when you give an animal the correct basic care, it lives long. I see a lot of Americans who don't get correct basic care. They don't do so well, and they are more vulnerable to infection in a way that a well-cared-for animal is not. So how does your initiative interlock with that broader complex policy of keeping us all in that good space? Thanks. Um, thank you for that question. I, you know, it's, it's a very valid question. You're talking about uh, the environment in which a virus attacks anything and anybody. And, and good public health practice, good health care practice uh, allows for exactly what you're saying. Um, it's, a broad, it's a broad issue. It is, it, we have to look and see what's happening right now in the world. Um, we have some of the worst outbreaks in places where there is insufficient money because of poverty, uh, insufficient public health infrastructure, infrastructure uh, or insufficient health care, and so forth. And so what do we see? We see more people getting sick there. Um, any policy that we take in terms of addressing biological warfare, bioterrorism, and naturally occurring diseases has to take into account good nutrition, public health infrastructure, access to health care, vaccines, as Max brought up, access to uh, antibiotics, fresh water, all, all of that. Uh, if we don't do that, we are creating additional vulnerabilities that we don't actually need to have be there, you know, at all. Right. Hello. Uh, so I want to first say thank you to everyone on the panel for being here today. And um, I also want to say Max Brooks. I, uh, so the day after I read your book, World War Z, I looked into Masters of Public Health Programs in Epidemiology. So I was inspired to go into that field. Um, I absolutely love it. I don't exactly do epi stuff, data analyst, but still, uh, thank you. Uh, anyway, so I had a question kind of like in regards to, so you know within the United States we have these wide open fields of like agriculture where we're you know growing plants and we're raising cattle. Um, and so I previously had taken a plant pathology class and they did say it is a concern like bioterrorism because we have these wide open fields. And so I was wondering like how much of a concern is that for this panel, and if so, is there a way like that we can like prepare for kind of like the worst case scenario for that? I'm just curious. <laughs> let, me, let me just give you a, a quick short answer and then we'll dig into the experts about this. Whenever you hear an attack on regulations, 
This is very, oh, we're over-regulated. There's regulation. There's a reason we have regulation. There's a reason we have the Food and Drug Administration. There's a reason we have a Department of Agriculture. All of you would be a lot richer if we didn't have to pay for those things. But we'd all be dead. <laughs> the reason we have that is so we can check and we can monitor. And one of the things the panel is doing is trying to open communications between all these departments. So if a virus does show up, it can go, say, to CDC and then to the Army at Uzamrid, and they can go, oh, wait a minute, there's a genetic footprint on this that doesn't match a known strain. So that's why we have regulations. Um, yes, agro-terrorism, agro agricultural warfare is a huge, huge uh, concern to us. Uh, there are things that are termed blast. There's wheat blast and soy blast. And the reason they use that term, I mean, other than uh, the scientific reason, uh, is because uh, the introduction of something like that will just blast all the way through our, our uh, crops. Um, they could decimate our economy. The agriculture is such a huge part of our, uh, of our economy. Uh, and once started, we we can't necessarily just stop it. Um, conveniently, when, when uh, human beings get sick, yes, we, we can pass you know, certain diseases on. Um, but there's an incubation period. There's some you know, stuff going on there, except for in World War Z. But uh, with agricultural threats, it starts one place, and it, and it flies uh, through. So it's a, it's a huge um, concern for us as well. Is anybody here of Irish descent? You're right. Most of you are here because of that, because there was a blight, and that's another issue. So, so it's, not, it's not science fiction. I mean, it, we literally have seen these disasters throughout history when a blight has come through and wiped out our food source. Thank you for uh, coming, you three. I uh, appreciate your information. Uh, just wanted to ask, is, do all viruses have the capability of being weaponizable? And if so, is there a virus that is a little bit harder in your experience to mitigate against, uh, such as Ebola. Uh, I know that was a big scare uh, not too long ago, and then it just it went dark, like nothing came from it afterwards. But I was curious what would be the worst uh, virus that could be, uh, that our nation could face that would be a trouble to contain. So yes, uh, you know, technically all viruses, all bacteria for that matter, could be weaponized. Um, but you know, you can see certain, certain diseases don't affect us as much as other diseases. You know, the worst case scenario now is a genetically engineered organism. Um, but you know, I say now and would also call your attention to the fact that the Soviets, when they were, you know, big into their biological weapons program uh, back in the 70s, they experimented with inserting Ebola into influenza because we get sick with influenza much easier than we get sick with uh, or infected with uh, Ebola. Um, now, they didn't go on to do much more with that, uh, so we hear. Um, but that, that, I think, is the, is the biggest concern. Um, at the same time, you know, we're talking a lot about intentional stuff and that, you know, this is germ warfare. Um, pandemic influenza uh, can be hugely, horribly devastating and terrible. Um, Mother Nature uh, modifies uh, its own uh, vac uh, vaccines, it, its own uh, viruses. And if we got a mutation that was truly, truly beyond, um, it would fly through the world. It would kill millions. So both. So you're, so you're saying that it would be sort of like a um, a surprise inside a package, if you will, if someone wanted to put another virus or uh, genetically modify it and put it within influenza, it could be. It would be, be more of an issue. It would be, you know, um, and it depends on how the disease presents. Uh, if everybody's walking in, I mean, as it is, you guys know how many diseases are described by, um, with symptoms that are flu-like symptoms, you know. But if you're, if you're going into a hospital or, you know, to a laboratory and, they, and they're testing, in that kind of scenario, they may test and find influenza before they find the Ebola stuck inside the influenza. Yeah, and, and that's a really good point because, you know, younger people don't understand this, but anybody my age understands that we lived through the great modern plague of AIDS. And we know that for 10 years, nobody knew that it was AIDS. Everybody was dying of 
pneumonia. I mean, I think what to, to this day, Liberace officially died of, yeah, he died of pneumonia. Uh, and this is where science crosses with the social, and this is where you guys come in, is that something like Ebola is so scary and it's so quick that it provokes a social reaction. Oh my God, Ebola, quick, send in the, we sent the army to West Africa, that's how much we cared. So imagine you're in West Africa dying of AIDS as an army convoy races by you to go take care of the Ebola. You know, that's what's happening over there. People dying of malaria, and they're like, quick, I'm dying. They're like, do you have Ebola? No, I have a malaria. Wait. And, and so we need to understand there's a social element to every plague because one of the great, we just, we didn't wipe out AIDS in this country, but we won the war on AIDS, not with science, but with social, social justice. We all came, it was with education. We came together and we realized this is what we have to do, not to allow it to spread. There still isn't a cure for AIDS. There's no vaccine, but we're keeping it at bay because of education. Thank you guys. Hi. Um... Thanks for coming doing this panel, I appreciate it. Um, my name is Chris Daly, when I'm not dressed like a space Nazi, I work on, uh, with a company called Synertex on a product called the Chemical and Biological Integration Platform. Um, it's just what it sounds like, there's a lot of like epi and social tools and stuff, a lot of big data and machine learning stuff behind that. One of the uh, struggles we run into over and over um, is that it's difficult to get timely and accurate case counts of one disease or another in specific regions. So if you want to know like what the risk of I, I don't know, chikungunya or whatever in central India is, you won't have numbers from that area. Uh, like the most recent numbers you'll have will be from like 1987 or something like that. And like ministries of health from different countries will put out case count information for some of the big name diseases, but they're usually like time late by like a month or something like that, or they're highly aggregated. So they're listed on like a national scale as opposed to like a regional scale. Uh, some of them put out data in PDF format, which is about as useful as a clay tablet from a data science perspective in terms of like data. Uh, propagation and things like that. Um, so data availability and consistency is a huge problem uh, from the technical side. Do you see any research or activism um, present right now that you think could help alleviate that in the relatively near future? Well, I can tell you that uh, the government is certainly taking this issue very, very seriously. However, I think we sort of suffer from um, uh, 100, 200, 300 different methods and ways of reporting with all different kinds of data streams going in all different directions. Um, it needs to, and it's trying to, figure out how to gather that information uh, and analyze it you know, appropriately. Uh, you're absolutely right, the delay in, uh, in re reporting or knowing what we're looking at is, is a big issue too. Um, frankly, if we're waiting around until people are getting sick and going to the hospital or calling 911 uh, and then saying, oh, look, this person has a, has a truly terrible disease that you know, looks unusual, um, if we've gotten all the way to that point, it, it will be too late. So many other people will be able to, and then we'll be stuck in an in, uh, in emergency situation trying to out, uh, contain an outbreak. Um, without the data, having gotten the data in the first place. In the middle of that situation, too, is not the time to be trying to gather data. So, uh, you know, people are trying. Industry is trying, too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is kind of about willful misinformation. So my, my grandfather was struck with polio um, and spent time in an iron lung. He was crippled. I never knew him when he wasn't crippled. Um, but it seems that, you know, at the time that we as a country kind of experienced all of those diseases. There was a massive public buy-in into vaccines, into combating these things. But now that doesn't seem to be the case that there is kind of a blanket public buy-in. And now I have family members who are willfully ignorant, if that makes sense, regarding yeah. vaccines and things like that. So I know like the, 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 one of the most important things to combat this sort of thing is education, but what do you do about people who won't be educated and who have an intrinsic mistrust of the public health system and the government. Well, you, you know, you, you, when it comes to education, you have to look at it sort of the way you look at counterinsurgency. It's like you're never gonna convert the Taliban, but there are, there are people in a village who could go either way. 
And those are the people that you have to reach out to. You have to reach out to the people who are open to being educated, but just don't have the education. I mean, there are always gonna be people, no matter what you say, no matter what you do, they're gonna be like, oh no, oh no, no, no. I, I vaccines, Pfft. hey, hey, there's a woman named Jenny McCarthy, and she, and she used to take her clothes off for a living, so I trust her. And you're never gonna convert those people. These are the flat earthers. But the people who are like, God, I really, I don't know what to believe. You go, okay, this is a start. Because you're right, and this is the problem. We're victims of our own success. Because if I, when I was a little boy, had said, I don't wanna get vaccine, vaccinated, my grandmother smacked me in the back of the head. <laughs> but we're losing the, the living memory right now. We're losing those people who remembered it. The, the man who taught me how to write, my mentor was a guy, he is a guy named Alan Alda. He was on a show named, called MASH. And I remember we used to all vacation together at this one place, and, and in the 80s, they got in a masseuse. It was a very big deal. And my mother was like, Alan, you must go get a massage. And Alan's like, I don't get massages. My mother's like, Alan, why? And he goes, because it reminds me too much of the physical therapy I had when I had polio. My mentor had polio. But guys like Alan are, are getting rarer and rarer. So the less of the people we have, the more we need this. Um, with genetic uh, uh, disease and stuff that you can, I can make in my basement, how do you separate the ones from, these machines have actual use for crop strains or for this, that. They can also be used to make disease. How do you fight who gets what and how you regulate, oh, no, you can't buy it because you're gonna make a disease, you can buy it, you're gonna make a plant protein. How would you fight something like that? Badly. <laughs> <laughs> Currently, we don't, it's, it's too hard to get a hold of. It's extremely difficult. There's a whole category of stuff called dual use. Um, some of which can be made, you know, used to make vaccine and some of which cannot. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a huge challenge. We haven't figured it out yet. Ken? Yeah, and just, I was going to make the point that you see that problem in this area, but you see it across the spectrum. You know, I've spent you know, 20 years in the Justice Department. So, for instance, there's a little gizmo, I forgot what it's called, that can be used either in a radiation machine to, for, for medical treatment, but also can be used like in an oscillator or something like that for a nuclear weapon. And these were shipped to Pakistan, and that was against the law. That was a dual use, of course, you know, put to the right use, amen. We encourage it, we want people in Pakistan to be healthy. Put to the wrong use, you get in the wrong hands and can be result in a nuclear weapon. It's a really tough issue across the board, and it's one that we just haven't wrestled the ground, not even close. Good point. Thank you. So it's something you never hear about in the media. You always hear about a breakout in one country. So as herd immunity declines in this country because misinformation, we don't trust any of our institutions, we aren't even sure about democracy anymore. Uh, how do, is it possible to have an outbreak of the measles and an outbreak of the mumps or in, at the same time? How likely is that? It's, it's very likely. I, you know, it's a question, it's a question of, it's not just a question of reporting, it's also a question of what hits the media. So, uh, things are going on all the time, unfortunately, here in the United States, all the time. Uh, we're making a big deal out of measles because measles had been so unusual in terms of presentation. Uh, now, now, you know, it's front and center in the, uh, in the press, um, but other things are going on all the time, constantly. And you know, there, there's another aspect of germ warfare, which you have to remember is it's information warfare as well. You know, we're starting to get reports that a lot of the anti-vaxxer information online is pushed by the Russians. Yeah, we're starting to understand that the Russians are starting to put bots on medical websites that are not even being anti-vaxxer, they're just putting a debate out there. So they literally will have two different bots arguing over the validity of vaccines. So when people go online, they go, oh, I didn't even know this was debatable. They're trying to sow doubt. So they don't have to hit us with a germ bomb. They can just hit us with a lie bomb, and that will be enough to let a vaccine spread. I mean, sorry, not a vaccine, to let a germ spread and to roll back vaccines. Because let's remember, a lot of our enemy state competitors, Russia, China, Iran, they may not want to destroy us. They just want us off the world stage. 
And what's the best way to have us looking in instead of looking out is having to deal with a pandemic right here at home. Dr. George, you were talking about uh, the Soviet bio program back in the 70s, and I see a lot of great names up there on your, your panel. And I was wondering, why isn't Ken Alabeck on there? I mean, he's you know, the father of their program, and he's here and accessible. You know, it, did you guys not want to approach him, or is he just not interested anymore? Well, so Ken is doing his own thing. Uh, Ken is certainly uh, a force to be reckoned with all by his, himself. Um, Ken, uh, but you know, Ken, Ken's uh, experience is very unique, and uh, we've certainly drawn upon his, his, his experiences and his information and, and what he has had to say. Uh, the other thing about Ken, though, is that he disappears every once in a while, and we can't find him anywhere and wonder where he's going. Um, but he's, he's one of our, you know, one of our world uh, experts, and, and certainly we, we, we've drawn upon his information. Hi there. So, so on the uh, the subject of like measles, I've uh, just recently uh, like uh, seen some videos on it and seen that uh, you know it was basically eradicated for the most part. There was like small you know pockets in like Amish and Jewish communities, but on the subject of like diseases on viruses, uh, like smallpox, I am aware there's only like what like the CDC has this uh, thing of smallpox. Uh, is there an inherent danger? in actually eradicating these diseases to the point where like only like one or two facilities have them in case, because I heard something, I think it was like Dartmouth, uh, they were cleaning, it was a college, they were cleaning out a an old closet and found a vial that marked smallpox. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an attack, it just be something like that and you have an outbreak again. And you know, you only got like a couple of facilities that actually have these diseases that can make the uh, uh, vaccine. So is there a, an inherent danger in that? Well, so, um there are two answers to that, I think. One is, if we were living in an ideal world where everybody was happy and joyful and not looking to hurt each other, then we would say eradication is completely fine and just keeping a few little, uh, you know, viruses, little, a few stocks around for research purposes or just in case, you know, something arises again by itself. Mm -hmm you know, then we, we would be okay with that. I think the problem that you're, you're uh, you know, alluding to is it's not 100% under control necessarily. Uh, the Soviets uh, weaponized huge amounts, tons of smallpox, and we're not sure where all of that got off to. Um, <laughs> they buried a bunch of stuff physically uh, in, on, a, on a particular island. It doesn't mean that just because you bury it that it's gone away. It's a it's a hardy virus. Um, in in yeah, that island in the in the Arctic near the Arctic. Yeah, so they buried smallpox on an island in the Arctic on a warming planet. Anyway, <laughs> yes. uh, this is what I'm saying. Is so there is there is an inherent danger. <laughs> yes. There is an inherent danger, and yes. you know the thing the thing is, and one of the reasons we wanted to do this. Uh, graphic novel about germ warfare is not because we're all just fascinated with history. It is because history repeats itself. And we're not sure where all this stuff is. But I think the third thing is that what people were able to do centuries and decades ago, people are certainly able to do now. It's just a matter of getting your hands on some things, uh, perhaps, like ge perhaps genetically modifying some things, and we're right back to where we were before. Uh, yeah, I work in IT, um, World War Z, very popular with my colleagues, partly because we have our own actual zombie outbreaks to deal with. Um, and, and kind of on that theme, uh, and I also live about 40 minutes from Fort Detrick, so that's kind of on my mind. I was wondering if you could talk about kind of the ethical debate, because like we've had, you know, in IT, the equivalent of a biosafety level four thing getting out of Fort Detrick, which was the NSA tool leaks over the last couple of years from the uh, Shadow Brokers group. And, you know, there are people who say, why did NSA even develop that, given that it would be so hazardous if it ever leaked out? And uh, uh, just wondering if that's something that, uh, or, or like, where does that debate go on the biological side of it? And does the biological side look at the computer science side and say, well, there are lessons we could learn there, or we could, there are lessons we could teach there? Yeah, I think as a, you don't need to be an expert to answer the question about ethics, because we're all citizens. We're all the experts on that. See, this is the, the reason 
that we all have to be educated and we have to read the news and we have to make informed choices because we are the boss. We don't get to blame the government in a democracy. You don't, because we are the government. You know, in Game of Thrones, there's like 12 people making the decisions for millions and everybody else is just praying to God they don't die. <laughs> That's not us. And so if we understand the issues, then we hold our government accountable. We are the ones that say, no, 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 you're not allowed to do that. I'm the taxpayer, I'm the voter. I get to make the choice whether I want you, the expert, to do that. That's not ethical. Because there's a reason we didn't use the atom bomb in Vietnam or in Korea or in many other places, because it was the voters that would not stand for that. They didn't want to live in a country that would repeat Hiroshima as something convenient. And we're not a country that wants to use germ warfare as a convenient way to wipe out an enemy. We're just not. So the only thing that keeps the experts in check is you. And you won't be able to do that. We, I won't be able to do that if we don't understand the issues. So it's a little uncomfortable, makes my head hurt sometimes. And look, I suffer from dyslexia, so this ain't easy for me. But when we step into the ballot box, we step into the polling place and we cast our vote, we need to know what is right and what is wrong. I would just add that we are looking at the cyber side as well, yes. Hi, Mr. Brooks, I had a quick question for you about uh, one part of your book, World War Z. There was one character who was described as a uh, Civil Air Patrol dirigible pilot. I was just wondering uh, what your connection, if any, to Civil Air Patrol is. Oh, the reason, in World War Z I have blimps, uh, and the reason I have is just because blimps are very convenient because of loiter time. So I thought that was a, a great way to do it. One last question I think we have time for. Uh, yeah, Ken, you kind of mentioned about developing a, a national plan for response to viruses and uh, bacteria outbreaks. Can you talk a little bit about um, coordinating with state level plans or county level plans and then also with regional plans or with Canada and Mexico or with the globe? Yeah, I think people should suspect that we actually stood you up to, do, to ask that question because it's the perfect question for us. Um, I, could, I could go on all afternoon, but I'll spare you. Um, yes, the, the, we have been very focused on, let me step back a second. One of the problems is what we alluded to earlier, sort of lack of attention or insufficient attention to this problem, all right? So we're focused on that. But also, and part, partly as a symptom of that, within the government, we don't have, within the U.S. federal government, enough coordination among all the different actors in the health area, defense area, justice area, and so on, all of whom have to play a part in biodefense, whether it's naturally occurring or man-made threats. That is even more a problem when you talk about going from the federal to state and local coordination. And there is, you know, a good bit of coordination. They do, you know, live, live exercises to try to exercise that. But it's wanting. Then when you take it from there to the international scale, and I think um, Asha could, could speak to that too, you know, there, there are international conventions and the like that we alluded to. There, has, there is coordination, but my, our hope is that the more, the higher profile that this issue gets here within the U.S. at the top levels of our government, the more that's going to then pull other actors, be they state and local or international actors, into a broad consensus that we need to get more serious about this issue. So great question. Thank you. All right, we've got one more minute. I just want to wrap up. And I want to say that in a time of division, there is a moment of hope because this is when they say a bipartisan panel, they really mean it. And as a citizen, that was very hopeful for me meeting these people because they are Democrats and Republicans and they understand something very fundamental. Germs don't vote, right? Germs don't care what your political affiliation is. They don't, you know, at a time of identity politics, they don't care about your race, they don't care about your gender identity, they don't care. They don't care how you identify yourself. They're coming for us, all of us. And so this is something we can all get together on. And it is hopeful because if we educate ourselves, it's also a great way of getting rid of anxiety if we know what we're talking about. When anthrax hit my building, 30 Rock, I might have been the only one there that wasn't scared. 
because I already knew about anthrax. I'd already been scared. So I knew how to deal with it. So I went in, everybody's freaking out. Drew Barrymore's passing out, and Tom Green had to bring her back in. And, and I was like, guys, it's just anthrax. So if you're feeling scared, if you're feeling anxiety, the best thing to do, just learn about it. And then you will feel better. And then all of us, experts and regular folks, will be able to keep the germs at bay because what keeps us healthy also keeps us safe. So thank you everybody for coming. I will be signing this down at the booth. Uh, it gives us great hope to see all of you here. Thank you.